If we could just understand that core value and understanding that God loves us more than we could ever imagine or realize. Uh, many times we don't feel lovable because we aren't. But yet He chooses in His grace to reach down and to love us. What a great thing it is to be a believer and follower of Jesus Christ to understand that love. Go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 42 is where we will be today. Uh, I do have to apologize if you are going to be watching online. It's probably tilted a little bit. I, I forgot my bracket um, that goes on my tripod that holds the camera, so it's going to be at a funny angle. I tried the best I could to get it right. So if you're watching online, it does look funny today, but that's why uh, I'll find that. I, I, I put it somewhere when I got home from our trip, and I don't know where I put it. I thought I knew where I put it, but I didn't. And so um, I'll go ahead and get that. So if you're watching online, it probably does look a little bit funny. For those of you here are live, I probably look funny anyways, but that's usual for me. Uh, so we are here today uh, in the book of Isaiah um, 41, 42. We will uh, study this this morning. One of my favorite experiences uh, while we were in Israel was the opportunity we had to go through Hezekiah's tunnel. Uh, if you watched last week, I showed a little bit of a video of this. One of the amazing things is this tunnel was carved out right around 700 B.C. So when you're walking through this tunnel, it's just kind of amazing to think what they did um, 3,000 years ago, or almost 3,000 years ago, as they made this tunnel, and how they would have built it. In fact, the beginning of the tunnel actually is very quite low, where you have to kind of duck a little bit. Uh, it's not bad with my family. Several years ago, when I went with a group, there were a couple of larger people, and they had to duck, and they could barely fit through this tunnel, because there's spots that are very tight. Near the end of the tunnel, it gets real high, but that's because they started too high. Uh, they didn't even have any of the advanced equipment, and they had to have the water flow down at a certain way when they redirected the Gihon Spring. And uh, It's just kind of a neat experience, and I do have to apologize ahead of time to my girls because this is the only picture I could find that I have of the tunnel. Uh, my girls, I'm sure, don't want their pictures on the, the faces on the screen. But as I think of this tunnel... Um, uh, Ron, could you hit the front lights for us? It's so bright outside today. Um, the one that says F. Um, anyways, you see this tunnel, and it was very interesting because the girls basically, they're all right. Their heads at that part aren't hitting. To me, I was a little bit higher. You have to kind of walk through a little bit tilted uh, so you don't duck and you don't uh, fall. But one, one of the things we tried to do was to turn our lights off while we were in the tunnel. Now, if you've never experienced complete darkness before, that is complete darkness because there is no light source. The tunnel is probably a quarter mile long, and when you're in the middle of it, and the tunnel kind of doesn't go straight, it kind of curves in different ways, and it is dark. And when we tried to walk through it in darkness, I'm hitting my head on things, it doesn't go straight, so you're turning, and you're, it was really tough. There was something about having a light and to be able to turn the light on that made such a powerful difference. Well, we're going to be reminded today as we start that Jesus is the light of the world. And there's something about Jesus that makes a powerful difference in our lives. And that's what I want you to see, Roman numeral number one here today that God sent Jesus to be the light of the world. This theme is mentioned over and over in Scripture, from the Old Testament all the way really to the end of the book of Revelation, the New Testament, that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Now I've mentioned this over and over, we don't think light uh, is as big of a deal today as it was in those days. Yes, it's important to us, but we have lights everywhere. In fact, the big thing in our society today is we talk about light pollution. We have too many lights at night where it never really gets dark around here. 
Um, but yet the idea of light, when it is a complete darkness, that light makes a powerful difference. I mean, even think of this morning uh, when you woke up, and maybe you were up early before the sun was up, but there's something when you wake up and that sun shines in the window. Isn't there something different about that mornings than like yesterday morning when you woke up and there's snow on the ground? Uh, your attitude this morning was probably different than your attitude yesterday. I know mine was a little bit. I woke up and, wow, bright sun, this is great. Yesterday I woke up and like, snow. I don't want snow anymore. We're done with snow. It's April. But the light made such a powerful difference. But to understand this light and the importance of it, one of the things we're reminded of in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 5, is that God declares himself to be the creator. Look at verse 5 here, Isaiah 42. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. He says, this is God who created the heavens and earth. Over and over in the book of Isaiah, it mentions that God the Creator says this. It's not just Isaiah. Psalms often reminds us that God is the Creator. When God refers to Himself in Exodus, He talks about the fact that He was the Creator. This is such a great emphasis that God created the world. Why do I want to emphasize this? Because we live in a society where even churches try to degrade the fact that God created the world. They think, well, maybe, you know, because science talks about this evolution and it, it seems like the evidence for evolution is so overwhelming and powerful that there's no way they can be a creator. But yet there are many groups and organizations that truly study the science and reveal many ways that creation did happen, that it was real, even the evidence of the flood is all around, that God was the creator. Now why is this so important? First of all, if God was not the creator, then what happens? God is a liar. Because he says here that he was the creator. So if God did not create the world, God is a liar and we can trust none of God's word. This is so core foundational for us as, as a faith. And this is why I believe the enemy loves pushing this whole idea of the evolutionist theory and that this is so not a theory anymore. It's taught as fact everywhere. It's not even a theory. Where something that's fact is supposed to be observable, repeatable, and, and it can't be. And yet it's often taught as a fact, but it's not. You see, the Bible says that God created, not just in Genesis, throughout the whole Scripture, because we understand He's a creator. And if He is the creator, He made us. We are accountable to Him. He knows how we work. He knows how we operate. He knows how everything functions. And over and over we're reminded, He is the creator. And when we understand that, that He created us, that He is the one who made us, therefore we have to submit to His plan. We also see that God sent Jesus to establish justice on the earth. Back up to verse 1 of chapter 42. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. Here it talks about how the Creator has sent the Messiah. Isaiah many times talks about the Messiah, which we know when we describe Jesus Christ. Christ is the New Testament word for the Old Testament word, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Promised One. God promised that He was going to send Jesus Christ to the earth. And it says that he is going to bring justice to all the nations. 
This could really mean two different things. We know that when Jesus has his millennial reign, when he reigns on the earth for a thousand years, that it's going to be a place where justice reigns supreme. Now this is important for us to realize. We all love justice. I love sports. And I'm actually a big fan of television replays and using replays to get the call right in sports. Some people don't like them. They think, well, if the ref made a bad call, that's just part of the sport. We live with it. There's just something to me when I see a bad call that I think if we have the ability on TV to watch it, that it should be changed. I think of last night. I was watching a, a Red Wings game, a hockey game. And one of the Red Wings player got a call, a penalty against him for tripping. And when they showed the replay, the replay clearly showed the player tripped over his own feet and that the Red Wings player didn't even touch him. And yet there was still a penalty, and after that penalty, because of that penalty, the other team scored. And that really bothered me because it's like, man, he got that penalty and he didn't do anything wrong. This isn't just. Well, we live in a world that's not just. We live in a world that's not fair. One day, Jesus will come, the Messiah will come to this earth, and he will create fairness and justice. But I think this has more to do with not just the end time justice, but the idea of justification. Well, what do I mean by that? Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Since therefore we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The term justification here in the New Testament means declared righteous. Jesus came to save sinners. We are all sinners. We are born sinners apart from God. But Jesus declared that if you believe in me, I will declare you justified. I will make sure you are righteous. When you stand before God, you can't say, well, I did all these good works, I did these good things. That's not enough. But Jesus will say, look, I paid the price on the cross. I justified them. I am declaring them to be righteous. And I believe that one of the things the Messiah, yes, He will reign with justice when He comes to the Millennial Kingdom, but that He wants to bring justification to us today. Verse 2 talks about the first time he came to the earth, and we know there will be a future time he comes, Scripture tells us. But in verse 2, it says, He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the streets. A brushed reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his law. This talks about when Jesus came the first time. You see, the people thought that Jesus came because the Old Testament talks about a Messiah conquering the enemies, establishing a kingdom. They thought that that's what Jesus was going to do. Jesus was going to come victorious as a conquering king, but yet here we're told that he's actually going to come and not even break a bruised reed. Basically, he's going to come gentle and mild. And that's really what Jesus did when he first came. He didn't come with force to conquer. The people thought he would. In fact, today is often called Palm Sunday. We celebrate the fact that Jesus came a week before his death and he entered Jerusalem. Now, I want to take a moment just to think about that as it's Palm Sunday. He comes and the people are yelling, Hosanna, which means God save us. They were expecting as they laid their palm branches down that Jesus was going to come into Jerusalem, throw off the Roman government, and become king. They didn't understand this portion of the prophecy that he was going to come and he was going to endure to the end and that endurance meant that he was going to die on the cross. Just to give you a little historical understanding, as we see here, this is the Temple Mount, where the temple would have been. This would be the Mount of Olives. 
Many people believe that there was actually a walkway from the Mount of Olives that came and came into Jerusalem, which really makes sense if you would see how deep the Kidron Valley is, and there was an eastern gate right here on the other side. Now, you say, well, I don't know if that, they could actually build something like that. But if you look on this side, see this side, this archway right here? This was actually, they're actually finding this. Our family had the opportunity to go underground. This is all buried right now. From this area down, it's all buried today. It's underground. But they've dug underground. And when we were over in Israel, we got a chance to go in there and to see this. Uh, we got to see some of these arches. If you look right here, see the archway right here? There were arches built on top of one another. And actually, there was even a dam built because there was a pool on the other side, uh, originally, they had built a dam. And this was an, a walkway that wasn't on the Mount of Olives side, but was on the other side. If we go back to um, our understanding here, what would happen? Now, this is a little bit hard to see. I tried to get a better Google Earth one, but it, it didn't work so well. This here is the Temple Mount. This is the Mount of Olives. This is where a walkway would have been through the Kidron Valley. Jesus would have come from somewhere here in Bethpage, over here, Bethpage and Bethany, where he stayed. This area here on the backside of the Mount of Olives wouldn't have had house, too many houses. It would have actually had a lot of tents. You see, people in, would have come to Jerusalem for the Passover feast, which was going to be in a few days. And they would have come from Galilee and from all over, and they would have set their tents up and they wouldn't have stayed, most of them, in Jerusalem. They would have stayed in their tents outside. And as Jesus begins this procession over the back of the Mount of Olives and comes down the Mount of Olives, and there would have probably been the walkway here, people from Galilee and everywhere are saying, Hosanna, God save us, God deliver us. They expect Him to be the king to defeat the Roman army. So as he comes through, again, we picture now he's coming this way over the Mount of Olives. They're throwing palm branches, and he enters in the temple. Uh, he does things like clear the temple that week. And we celebrate this, and they're reminded that this is Palm Sunday. They thought Jesus was going to come to deliver them from the Roman government. Instead, Jesus predicted that in a short time, all this would be destroyed, and it was. Picture this like a basically an empty plot and the Romans just knocked it all over down here in this area. Jesus didn't come the first time to be the king, but a week later after Palm Sunday, as we're going to celebrate this coming week, Jesus died on the cross and rose again to ultimately be victorious over sin, to give us life. And what Jesus did is He came to open the eyes of the blind. Look at verse 6. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring prisoners out of the dungeon from the prisons who sit in darkness. He says, I have great plans for you. Here's what the Messiah is going to do. But we know in the New Testament, it wasn't just a physical deliverance. Jesus was going to set us free from the darkness of sin, the chains and bondage of sin. And He was going to set us free and give us the hope, the light. This is even mentioned here in um, Luke. If you remember when Jesus was first brought into the temple, it says, as Simeon took him into his arms and he blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people. A light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. He's basically quoting Isaiah 42, 6 when he's holding up the little baby Jesus to say, I've seen the light. He is the light of the world that's going to bring light to the Gentiles, going to bring salvation to all men. Isaiah talks much about the destruction of 
Babylon, that it's going to take place about 100 years later from when this is written, around 600 B.C. And basically it describes how the old system is going to be destroyed. What was the old system? It was how they had to continually sacrifice to God. But it wasn't enough. The new system, the new covenant, the new hope that Jesus, the Messiah, would bring was so much greater. You see, the Old Testament laws entrapped. The Old Testament laws entrapped people. And you know, there's a lot of people today entrapped in law. They think if I do all these things, if I give to the church, if I do this and do this and do this, I might earn a spot in heaven. When we went over to uh, Israel, we went up and down some elevators, and a lot of times people, places will have two elevators, and they'll call one of the elevators the Shabbat elevator or the Sabbath elevator. What's different from a Sabbath elevator compared to a regular elevator? On the Sabbath day, the elevator, the Shabbat elevator, will stop at every floor. By the way, one of the places we stayed at 18 floors, I couldn't imagine that, stopping at every floor. Uh, reminds me if you've seen Elf uh, for Christmas time, how he just goes and you stop at every floor. But why does it stop at every floor? Because they have rules uh, according to their guidelines when God says you're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath day, that their rabbis say that pressing the elevator button is work. So therefore, if you press the elevator button on the Sabbath, you are sinning. So what you can do is you go into the elevator and it will stop at every floor so you can get off. And they are trapped in all these external works, how they've taken the Old Testament law even today and made all these rules and regulations about the Old Testament law and they're enslaved in the works where Jesus says, I've come to set you free. It's not about a religion and doing these religious things. It's about understanding that Jesus Christ came down and loved me when I was a filthy, rotten sinner. I did nothing to deserve it, and yet I want to love Him and serve Him, and I want to love and give in return, not in order to earn this favor. And that's how Jesus came to bring hope to all men. Verse 10 of chapter 42. Sing to the Lord a new song, His praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands, their inhabitants. Let the desert and its cities lift up their voice, the villages of Kedar, the inhabitants. Let the inhabitants of Sela sing for joy. Let them shout from the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare His praise. It says, let's, from all over the, the world or the wonderful land of Israel, let's rejoice in, in our great God because the Messiah has come to bring us hope. You know, as I was thinking this and it described things, and, and I know sometimes it's a show and tell that I get to do because I'm up here, is I get to show you pictures of things we saw when we were over in Israel. And some people wonder, they say, well, well how come Israel's called the promised land? You know, one of the things I was reminded of as we described is all of the natural beauty that you see over in the land of Israel. One of the things that we were able to see, and actually we drove some up, this is called Mount Hermon. So you can go in Israel, this is taken at, of Mount Hermon, and we saw it very similar. This, isn't our, this one's not our picture, but very similar to that, the snow-covered mountains. In fact, we drove up some hills way over here and uh, you think the hill in Benzonia is steep, steep driving up. There are some hills up there. You drive like straight up, and I don't know how they do it in the snow. They had snow piles. I don't know how they did it. But you have the beauty of a snow-covered mountain. We even went to a spot where they had stalactite caves right here in the land of Israel. As we went around, there's these desert mountains. This is overlooking uh, basically the Jordan River Valley, and on this other side would be Jordan. This would be like the, where the Jericho Road would be, these, this mountainous terrain. Then you also have these green grassy hills that you see in different spots. Um, here we are actually on the top of what's called, the, we're actually overlooking Jordan, the Jordan River Valley. We're on the top of um, Bet Shan, a city uh, on the border um, 
of Israel, and you have the green trees, and you have the plush land. Even you have waterfalls. And it's, it's just amazing to think about this little place that, uh, how, how far would you have to travel today to see a waterfall like this? We'd have to travel four hours to get up into the UP somewhere to see something like that. In Israel, basically almost anywhere in Israel, you can travel in three hours and see amazing things. What I, what I find amazing is it has basically almost many of the great features of the United States are kind of crammed in this little spot. And when it talks about the fact that one day we'll gather together in the promised land, and it's going to be an amazing thing, and we know it's going to be uh, transformed to the land, but it's going to be even far better. The point that I'm making is we have some great things to look forward to. Here's another view, just a couple other views. This is the Sea of Galilee from the Arbel Cliffs you have. You have the Mediterranean Sea of Sunset, God's wonderful place. And as God has this design, not only physical for land, but more important, spiritually, He came to bring hope to all men. And He calls all the earth to give praise to God. Look at verse 16. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into the light, the rough places, the level ground. These are the things I do. I do not forsake them. He says, I'm going to turn rough places into level ground. We mentioned this many times when we were traveling through Israel because there are hills everywhere you go. You have to go up and down hills. And you know what would be so much easier if you could just go straight? And instead of curving up and down and around, this is a picture that God's going to level it out to straighten things out. And then we see Roman numeral number two. God wants us to open our eyes to Jesus. One of the things we need to realize is that we shouldn't take God's blessings for granted. Look at verse 18 of chapter 42. Hear you deaf and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf but my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as a dedicated one, or blind as the servant of the Lord? He sees many things, but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear them. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness' sake to magnify his law, and make it glorious. What he's saying is people had a chance to see God's greatness, and yet their eyes were blind. Kind of reminds me here, I just showed pictures of the glorious land of Israel. I think the area we live in is a glorious place as well. But you'd be amazed how many times when I used to coach soccer and I would take my soccer boys to somewhere on the Sleeping Bear Dunes, and it was the first time they've ever been there. And I'm like, you guys live up here. You lived up here your whole life, and you never experienced the greatness of this wonder that millions of people come up here to visit every year. You know, sometimes we're like that as Christians. We have the Bible that reveals God's greatness. God is all working around us, and yet our eyes many times are blinded, we're hardened. We see the things of the world around us and that becomes so much pleasurable and it draws our attention from the things that really matter. And God reminds the Israelites, and I think it's good for us as well, that we will face consequences if we fail to look to God. Verse 22, But this is a people plundered and looted. They are all of them trapped in holes and hidden in prisons. They have become plunder with no one to rescue, spoil with no one to say restore. Whom among you will give ear to this, will attend and listen and come? He's talking to the Israelites. He says, I want to give you so much. And yet you have so much, so little. Because you failed to trust me. You failed to look to me. You failed to follow me. You failed to see what my word says. You failed to follow the words that you are given. Verse 24, who gave up Jacob to the looter and Israel to the plunders? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned? In whose way they should not walk and who they should not obey? So he poured on him the heat of his anger and the might of his battle and set on fire all around. He did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take heart. 
God wanted to bless His people, but instead He had to bring punishment. That's not just for the Old Testament. In Revelation, when it describes the churches, sometimes God brings punishment to us when we fail to look to Him. To say, hello, hi, get your attention here, pay attention. I am your God, follow me, do what I say, you will be blessed. And then we see Roman numeral number three, that God wants you to live fearless through Jesus Christ. I can't tell you how many times Scripture says over and over, do not be afraid. Fear not. It's everywhere. But how often do we live our lives in fear? How many people do you know around you live in constant fear? Boy, it really became evident in the last couple of years during the pandemic, didn't it? The idea of fear and what it's caused. The Bible says we can live without fear. How? We need to understand that we have been redeemed as followers of Christ. Verse 1 of chapter 43. But now thus says the Lord who created you. Remember, He's a Creator. He reminds us again, He created us. O Jacob, He formed you. O Israel, fear not. I have redeemed you. I have called you by My name. You are Mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. He says, I'm your God. I have redeemed you. Now I realize he's talking to Israel, but in the New Testament, we are called redeemed believers. I mean, God has paid the price and bought us out of slavery, slavery to sin. We've been redeemed. And He loves us with the love of a Father. And because of that, we know that He will be with us when we walk through the fire, when we walk through deep waters, it says. He will be our guide. No matter what you're going through in life today, you don't have to fear. You may be going through something very difficult. Remember, God says, I will be with you in the fire. I will be with you through the flood. I will be with you through the the flowing river. I am your God. We also have to remember that we are precious in the sight of God. Verse 4, Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Notice what it says in verse 7. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made, If we are called by the name of God, John chapter 1, verse 12, it says that if we've believed in Him, He gave us the power to be called the sons of God. If we are children of God, He says, I will be with you. I will bless you. You are precious, He says in verse 4. You are precious in My eyes. That's how God views you if you were a follower of Jesus Christ. You are precious. The song we sang before the message, Oh, how He loves us. To realize that we are precious in His sight. And because He loves us, we know that He will take care of us and that we do not have to live in fear. In conclusion, I want you to ask yourself these questions. First, Are you allowing Jesus to be your light? Is Jesus your light? Is He bringing you hope in this dark world? Does He give you hope for a future beyond this life? 
Secondly, do you realize all the blessings you have in Jesus? If you are a follower of Christ, He has done so much for you. He wants to be with you, to walk through, to guide you, to help you. And lastly, are you living a fearless life? It's not we have to talk ourselves out of being fearful. It's saying, look, I have a God who loves me, a God who's sovereign, a God who's powerful, who's God is in control, a God who was, is, and always will be. I don't have to worry or fear, knowing that this life is not all there is. If I die from this life as a follower of Jesus Christ, I know that I have eternal life waiting for me. I have nothing to fear today or tomorrow, or for the future, because I have a God who's in control. We can live a fearless life. I want everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes. Before we take time for communion this morning, I want you just to take a moment to think about the greatness of your God. Think about how He is a light in this dark world. Think about how He died on the cross to save you and to bring you hope to be your light. Take a moment to think about Him.